Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in Australia. And thank you for joining this webinar with RSM and Colin Biggers and Paisley on business exit strategy. This webinar is webinar two of a three part series. We recently held a webinar with RSM's Andy Graham and Tim Goodman and Colin Biggers Paisley's John Meadmore on getting ready for sale. And today we have webinar two, exiting via a trade sale with RSM's Tim Goodman and Colin Biggers Paisley's Toby Norgate. If you missed webinar one, we will be providing all of the resources and recordings of these webinars to you after the series. Webinar three is to be held on the 18th of August and will cover exiting via an IPO. If you have any questions throughout this webinar, we will have time at the Q&A session at the end. So please put your questions in the Q&A box on the Zoom. Your questions will not be shown on the screen and are confidential. This slide here is to advise that the information covered is intended as general information only and should not be considered as advice. Should you have any queries post this session and would like to discuss any areas in more detail, please feel free to reach out to our presenters directly to discuss your needs. I would like to introduce the speakers for this series, RSM's Andy Graham and Tim Goodman. And from Colin Biggers and Paisley, we have John Meadmore, Toby Norgate and Brett Van Staden. Today, Tim Goodman and Toby Norgate will take us through the business exit strategy of exiting via a trade sale. I will now hand over to Tim Goodman to take us through what we will cover today. Thanks, Fran. What we'll cover in today's webinar in conjunction with myself and Toby from Collins Biggest Parsley is looking at the types of deal processes and the deal life cycle, an overview of the M&A process, maximizing your value on exit, avoiding value erosion through a transaction process, the differences between an asset versus a share sale, warranties and indemnities as they form part of a tra of transaction documentation and negotiation, and dealing with different types of buyers. Before we get into, before we get into the, the webinar, we'd like to conduct a couple of polls if we could. Um, and the first poll we can actually share with the group um, in terms of some of the insights that are gleaned from that. So the first one is, have you, have you been involved in a business sale transaction before? I'll just give you a little bit of time to complete that before we share that with the group. Okay, it looks like everyone's shared their responses and overwhelmingly, it sounds like most people have, or the, the good majority of the group have, have undertaken a transaction before. So this this webinar is going to be is going to be good because it does assume a certain level of of, of knowledge, um, and we hope that uh, you know it can be as interactive as it can be. So please feel free to put questions in the chat box, and we can address them um, at the end with the group. Um, the second question that we'd like to to ask the group is is what industries do we have representation from for today's webinar. So we're not going to share the results with the group publicly, but certainly we'll, we'll, I can share some insights, particularly in relation to sort of what we're seeing in the market in terms of various sectors and the transaction um, volume levels. Okay, thanks for everyone participating. So uh, a good cross cross section of of industries. Um, that there was a, a, a prevalence uh, towards financial services, health, and construction, which is broadly aligned to to what we're seeing in the market. Um, but majoritively, what we're seeing in terms of the standout sector is technology. So interestingly, that that wasn't one of the industry um, sectors that came out of the poll. Okay, we'll, we'll now start the, the session. Um, in terms of some of the reasons why vendors choose to sell, um, you, you can largely distill that into four clear areas. So, you know, vendors, you know, 
ultimately want to seek a liquidity event. You know, you're typically in business to to build goodwill with a view to to, to one day selling. So, you no know, vendors seek to either exit via a partial sell down or, or a full sell down. Um, you know, typically vendors have a lot of their their, their, their asset value trapped within their businesses. Up. So a liquidity event allows for that, that exit to occur. Um, you know, sometimes um, there's internal disputes um, where, you know, vendors might have been in business with, with family members or, or independent third parties. And over time, there's a delineation in strategy and that might be a catalyst or a precursor for, for a transaction. But where we see a lot of, um, reasons to sell is succession. You know, in, in Australia in particular, you know, vendors have, have have got family businesses, and you know, the next generation don't have that passion or enthusiasm or desire to take over the reins um, from from the patriarch or the matriarch or, or both, and that creates a succession issue um, and, and a catalyst for for a transaction. Um, in in similar circumstances, we also see strategic rationale as a motivator for, for a transaction. Um, and particularly this can be in, in sectors where there might be consolidation. So joining forces with a competitor, you know, may create scale, may create synergies, both from a revenue or cost perspective, or, or create um, opportunities to enter, enter new markets or product suites where uh, previously there wasn't, there wasn't participation. Um, so, and we see a lot of, a lot of transactions occur within um, you know, the supply chain, so vertically integrating, um, you know, a customer or supplier as part of a transaction. Um, less often than not, we see distress uh, as a catalyst for a transaction. Um, and this has become more prevalent as a consequence of COVID, but fundamentally there may be very good businesses that for whatever reason uh, may become over leveraged and, and COVID is a good example as to, you know, a particular stressor that's caused that particular problem that can okay that can create liquidity problems um and a, a transaction you know cures uh, or, or capital restructure cures that cures that problem and allows the business to continue and grow going forward um, in terms of the types of deal process that that you, you can undertake as a vendor when you choose to to, to undertake a process can be broadly uh, undertaken in, in four different ways and and typically, there's an inverse relationship with each of these to um, confidentiality, um, starting at the top. So a broad auction, you know, is a transaction where you, you, you go to market in a very public way. So there'd be media socialization, you know, there'd be, there'd be, there'd be zero confidentiality. You know, the market would be full, fully aware that there's an auction taking place. Um, and that might be akin to, you know, a, a very attractive asset or, or, a very, or a very large business where, you know, there's been multiple approaches within a very hot sector um, and, you know, you know, confidential is, is less of an issue. Um, a limited auction is, is similar to a broad auction. It's just not as public as, as what a broad auction would be. It's probably best described as, um, you know, you'd have a limited number of buyers, perhaps somewhere between 20 to 25, and you'd take that opportunity to, to them with confidentiality being less of a focus. Now, a targeted auction is where you go to a very um, definite buy universe, somewhere between probably five and 15 would be a likely scenario where it would be very focused on a particular suite of buyers and you'd engage with them on a, on a, on a highly confidential basis um, to ensure you know, there's competitive tension in that, in that auction. Or the last one is exclusive negotiation where you, know, you, may, you may have been approached by a buyer um, and you want to undertake a transaction with them, the offer is compelling, and you just deal with them on, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So really, what, what you ultimately want, want to get in any type of process is, is, is you want to generate competitive tension. So the best way to do that is to get a suite of buyers somewhere between four and 20 it is, is typical to ensure that you can solicit a, solicit a couple of offers um, to, to ensure you know, fair value is achieved but also understanding some of the terms that those offers might, might present. So it's not always about the quantitative elements of that offer. The qualitative elements are, can be particularly important as well, particularly if there's retention from a vendor perspective prescribed in those. 
um, that, that's that's really important too. And it's also good to get to get feedback as well. Not all buyers are going to want to buy your business, so to get that that feedback as well helps you, you know, put the business in the best light when you're engaging with other potential acquirers. Uh, in terms of the the, the broader M and A process, it can be distilled into you know a, a ten step process. Um, the first one being developing a sales strategy. Now, this is, I can't emphasize as much how important this is. As a vendor, you, you really need to be able to articulate, you know, what your what your value proposition is, you know, what your pillars of growth are and your value proposition. And really understand what your intentions are from a transaction perspective. So did you want to stay around um, and do a recapitalization and ride the next wave of growth with perhaps a PE player or did you want a full exit? You may be close to retirement um, and you're tired and you, and, you, and you want an exit. So really understanding what that what that strategy is sets the scene for who do you go to market to? You know, do you want to target your business towards, you know, a corporate trade player or perhaps private equity or a combination of both? Did you want to just look at local acquirers or would it be more of an international play? So really understanding what that sales strategy is, is absolutely pivotal to, to running what hopes to be a successful process. And to understand the buy criteria links straight from that sales strategy. So private equity might be highly attractive to, to your business. And if that's the case, you know, you'd need to pivot, pivot the, the process to, to cater for them accordingly. For example, you, a trade play might not be acceptable because of the confidentiality within your sector uh, and it may, cre may create issues. So uh, finding the right buyer profile is critical in, in terms of, of how, you, how you pitch that, that process to potential buyers. Uh, in terms of searching for potential buyers, there's a couple of ways that is undertaken. Um, typically, we as advisors have access to uh, global databases, which give us a lens into particular buyers who are transacting in sectors such as such as yours. So we know who's acquisitive, both locally and globally, and that helps uh, identify potential buyers. Also, um, you know, our network and, and similar to other advisors, if you've got a global network, that allows you to, uh, to match buyer and seller preferences globally um, and, and allows a whole suite of buyers that may not be in the public domain through um, searches in, in Google or just for local intermediary relationships. And then just understanding broader intermediaries in the market in terms of private equity funds are obviously highly acquisitive. They've got particular sector preferences. So, you know, finding an advisor who, who understands, you know, the market is, is critical as well. Now, in the first webinar, if, if, if you join that, uh, Andy, Andy and John would have taken you through, you know, the grooming process and getting ready for sale. What's critical at this juncture is, is really the whole risk identific identification key value driver assessment. So it's a, it's a, it's a good point to, to, to begin that whole transparency around you know, what makes your business tick, what drives value, but importantly, you know, what are the risk factors? Uh, are there any concerns? Are there potential any problems which could Create, create an issue at the end in terms of negotiation and documentation and ultimately the purchase price. And a good example of that is, um, you know, the R&D tax concession, if that's appropriate, if you're a technology business or you've claimed that incentive before, there has been systemic rorting uh, as part of that scheme. So we've seen companies have been misadvised by their advisor, they've overclaimed, and that issue has come out as part of diligence and that's had a potential transaction um, consideration issue where you know amounts have been held back to to mitigate the exposure to the ATO for that that overclaiming so really it's a it's it's a good place to to sit down step through all those issues and make sure all the appropriate protocols and risk mitigants are put in place so they're not a problem when when, when you get into due diligence and ultimately transaction negotiation and completion typically in any any transaction, there's, there's two documents produced. There's the information memorandum, as well as the flyer. And the flyer is really, a, a, I suppose, a, a, a very short form marketing document on a, on a no-names basis. It gives a bit of a flavor for the business and some qualitative and quantitative elements to really um, you know, test the buyer's appetite to see whether they're interested. If, if they are, 
they'd sign a non-disclosure agreement and we give them the information memorandum, which is a, a long form document, which gives your, um, you know, puts your business uh, or gives them the, allows them the ability to, to do a deep dive in your business, understand what the key drivers are, and then hopefully formulate a non-binding indicative offer. On the basis that we receive a non-binding indicative offer, and, and hopefully a couple, we can then do some offer and valuation analysis just to, just to sensitize and benchmark what those offers look like. And not always is the highest cash consideration the best, the best outcome. Um, some of the terms attached to those offer are, are very, very important as well from a qualitative perspective. So we're benchmarking all those and, and, and looking at what they look like in, in your eyes and you know, recommending what the best outcome in is. Um, then there's obviously the inevitable negotiations around some of the terms that offer. And then if that's, if that's agreed, then due diligence, which you know, you'd typically aim for a four to six week period, and that would cover off on legal, commercial, technology, tax, and accounting. And then on the basis that that's all accepted, um, you then go into the, uh, the, the, the transaction uh, documentation and it can either be far away of a sale purchase agreement or a business sale contract. And, and Toby will discuss the, the two, those two documents in a little bit more detail when he presents his section of this presentation and then closing, closing and then integration. Now, in terms of, I touched on the sales strategy in a little bit of detail previously, but really the, the sales strategy and optimizing that really needs to account take account of the nature and size of your business. So obviously not all, not, not all businesses are the same, um, and particularly from, from a size perspective. So if your business is, is quite large, you've got to assume you know, a certain level of sophistication in terms of that potential, potential buyer universe. So that would, 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 would drive you to align the process to a higher level of sophistication. Um, Conversely, if you're pitching towards, you know, a private equity acquirer who, who may not have a presence or an understanding of your sector, that would that would require you to to do a bit more of a deeper dive on the IM and present the, the business differently. If you were pitching it towards a, a trade player who would un, would typically understand your sector and, and be up the knowledge curve fairly quickly, uh, you obviously need to be cognizant of commercial sensitivity and confidentiality. Obviously, um, you know people. Your, your people are very important, as are your customers and suppliers. So the preservation of confidentiality is key, particularly with regard to employer retention. And we see vendors, um, you know, very sensitive around confidentiality with regards to their people and their names. Uh, you know, obviously competitors can poach people if they're given that, that level of detail. So there, there's mitigants that you can put in place. Uh, and Toby will talk about some of those. One, one is a black box scenario, so I'll let him talk to you a little bit more about that uh, and obviously the the vendor sale objectives so you know what 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 are your intentions as a vendor and what do you want to achieve from the transaction and and how, how does that align to you know the process that you're going to undertake uh, we talked about you know the style of process and whether it's a broad auction or exclusivity um, obviously you don't want to have just a single buyer that carries with it a significant amount of risk as does customer concentration. So you really want to have a number of bidders in, in a process if you can, just to create that competitive tension and, 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 and deals, deals do fall over for, for various reasons. So you, you wanna make sure to the extent one, one buyer falls away, you, you've got another one in the winds lining up, ready to, ready, ready to, ready to make an offer. Um, in terms of um, running, a, running a managed process, as opposed to, you know, doing it just single handedly and, and, and discussing with multiple bidders without through, through a formal process, you know, that, that allows the process to be controlled, uh, allows the flow of information to be measured um, and consistent. The last thing you want is different buyers having different information because that won't, that won't create a, a consistent offer. Um, you want to make sure you're dealing with multiple buyers to maintain competitive tension. Um, and that will obviously strengthen your, your negotiation, negotiation position with various buyers and obviously making sure you get offers at a consistent point in time to ensure that they're, they're, they're like for like. What's, what's important as, as part of a transaction and, and, and there's, a, there's an inherent risk 
the longer a transaction goes on for, the, the, the more likely valuation erosion will occur. Uh, one of them is obviously confidentiality um, and ensuring that's maintained throughout the whole transaction process. And at, some, at one point or another, there is going to have to be a lifting of the confidentiality veil, but you typically you want that when you've got a binding offer uh, and they're legally compelled to transact. Um, you only want to really provide limited information, uh, particularly from a financial perspective, up until such time um, as a non-binding indicative offer has been provided. Once a binding offer has been provided, then you can you can fully disclose what needs to be made to your potential buyer universe or your potential buyer if, if you're in exclusivity with them. Um, maintaining competitive tension is key, as well as retaining control of the process. Your management must stay focused on, on driving performance. Uh, typically, um, in, in a process, you know, there's material um, change or adverse changes in business. And if that happens throughout diligence up to completion, then you know, that gives the ability for a buyer to withdraw from the process. So you want to make sure business continues on as it is um, and there's no delineation from, from history. Um, making sure diligence is handed robustly and you know, the financial information presented in the, in the IM is what's, what is stacks up during diligence. That's important. So there's no uh, value grab or value chip from the buyer as you move as you move from a non-binding indicative offer to a to a binding offer making sure issues and um, are potentially identified early and resolutions provided um, and and be robust in your negotiations don't be prepared to walk away if, if it doesn't feel right or it doesn't sit right um, and understanding you know a buyer's concerns and how to address them is key and not not trying to address them at the last minute but really trying to address them as early as you can um, in terms of how, how buyers value businesses, they, they typically offer what's called an enterprise value. Um, so that's, that's not an equity value. The, the bridge between enterprise value and equity value is, is, is really comes down to um, the deduction for net debt, as well as any movement between uh, a normalised level of working capital and actual working capital. So you just need to be cognizant that not always what you're offered um, is what you get paid pre-tax at the end of a end of a transaction. So, some examples of net debt are you know third-party debt such as bank loans, overdraft, finance, leases, but that can also include other debt-like items such as tax. Um, sometimes we see excessive bonus provisions to management in there, um, as well as long service leave. So you just need to understand that they 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 can be potential purchase price reductions. Secondly, a business, a buyer will buy a business with a normal, normalized level of working capital. So typically what happens is there's a, there's a peg. And then when you deliver up your balance sheet at completion, there's an adjustment over or under for the difference between that target um, or, or actual working capital. So typically you, you want to negotiate a lower level of target working capital um, that obviously benefits you as a, as a vendor. And you want to ensure you can get as much of those assets and liabilities into the definition of net working capital as opposed to net debt, because any net debt adjustment is dollar for dollar. Net working capital is done on an average basis. So it's important to understand the treatment of these items um, and how they're calculated and how they interact with, with your purchase price. Thank you for that. I'm, I'm going to hand over to, to Toby now. Thank you, Tim. Um, a lot of food for thought there. And look, it's a very interesting topic, so I'm glad to be here today. Um, I'm going to be talking about some of the legal aspects, and, and some of it would dovetail in on what Tim's been talking about. We've got here um, what we're going to be talking about. So we'll start off with the initial documentation. And here we're talking about term sheets, heads of agreements, um, various things to, to get the key terms together. We're going to be talking about structuring. So the, the main question here is, will it be a share sale or will it be an asset sale? We're going to be talking about deferred consideration and earnouts. We're going to be talking about liability and particularly in the context of warranties and indemnities and some of the, the, the ways you might think about reducing those risks of liability. We're going to be talking about due diligence and data rooms. And then we're going to move on to dealing with different types of buyers, again, which will dovetail into some of the comments that Tim's been making. 
So initial documentation. You'll hear the terms, term sheets, expressions of interest, heads of agreement, and they really all do the same thing. They're, they're essentially taking the, the main important terms of an agreement and trying to, to reach headline agreement before you go into the detail of the documentation. And because of that, the more decisions and, and more important decisions you can, you can reach, you can, you can reach agreement on, the less time and cost it's going to take later when you're negotiating the, the bigger documents. Also important is going to be whether these documents are binding or non-binding. Normally, you'll have certain provisions in their confidentiality, maybe deposit, potentially uh, that there might be something around exclusivity, and that'll be that'll be binding, but sometimes the actual deal itself, and probably most normally is not going to be binding until you get to the, the formal documentation. Expressions of interest. Well, they're another term we give to, to the initial documentation. And, and essentially this fits into the auction model. So if you're selling your house, you might, you might send out options to, to a bunch of different people to, to put in a price, then you'll, you'll get your offers back and you decide which one you like most. Um, e each of these, these formats is appropriate in different circumstances. And sometimes, particularly on the smaller deals, we might just see uh, an exchange of emails with some key terms. But the, the key point is you want to be reaching agreement on headline issues as early as possible. Another really important part of the initial documentation set is confidentiality agreements. And this is really crucial. Tim mentioned a number of reasons for this. And uh, he, he touched on the concept of the black box. So what you what don't want to do is, for example, let your competitors come in, see all your, all your employees' details, see all your, uh, your customer details, see the pricing, offer your customers 10% less, take all the customers, hire your employees for 5% more and, um, and, and walk away with the business without paying for it. You don't want to give the, the buyer the keys to the house without paying for the house. Next, I wanted to talk about structuring. And the, the key issue here, is it going to be a asset sale or a share sale? Share sale, you're buying the shares, everything that the company owns, in the, everything the company owes, everything um, that's, that's a risk to the company, all the skeletons in the closet come with those shares. So for that purpose and that reason, the buyer is going to want to be looking really carefully at the due diligence and deciding, is this something they want to buy? What sort of adjustments need to be made? What sort of risks are they taking on? The asset sale, on the other hand, or sometimes known as the business sale, is an, an, an opportunity for the purchaser to cherry pick those assets they want. So they might want, uh, they might want the trademarks, the intellectual property, they might want the employees, they might want the lease, they might want the customer contracts, supplier contracts, um, all, all of these things, but they probably don't want the liabilities. They, don't, they probably don't want the tax liabilities. So it, it enables you to take some degree of risk out of the equation. But on the other hand, because you have to transfer each asset separately, uh, trademarks requires going to IP Australia, for example, the landlord requires um, negotiations to get the lease across, but because you have to do these these separate things and dealing with the different assets, some kind sometimes the the end part of the transaction can involve more work. And I've noted a few other issues here around around how you might structure, and it's going to be relevant to to what the assets are, what the industry is. Is there any assets which you need to take out, which are personal to the seller, transfer them before the sale? Um, is the risk of undisclosed liabilities. You might need to deal with your customers around change of controls and get their approval before you transfer the, the um, contracts across. Transaction documents will be different depending on which way we go. And tax, of course, is always going to be an important driver. And you'll definitely want to talk to a tax advisor early in the piece, maybe to one of our friends at RSM. Next, I wanted to talk about earnouts and deferred consideration. Here we're talking about 
we're talking about purchase price that's paid after completion. So normally uh, you might get in these circumstances a, a fairly large um, tranche of the, of the payment at completion, but some will, will, will stand back and, and be paid later dependent on, on the actual uh, performance of the business. And where this is, this is really useful and where I see it a lot is in circumstances when the, the seller and the purchaser have quite different views on value. So you're the seller, you're, you're pretty happy with your business, but you want to sell it. Um, you, you talk to the purchaser and you say, well, look, here's why this is a great business. Here's why you should be paying a lot of money. Um, look at all this growth that's going to happen. The purchaser looks at that with a skeptical eye and says, well, if that's the case, well, why don't you why don't you put your money where your mouth is? And if it does well, you get more. And I'm happy to pay what you want. But if it doesn't, well, you have to share the pain. So it, it can be quite useful to, to get the purchase price up for the seller. That being said, it also can bring its own risks and problems. The, the seller, if they're passing over the business, um, they've got a way they like to run the business. There's a danger that the purchaser might come in there, change the way the business is run, add in a whole lot of head office costs, for example, um, and as a result, the earn out doesn't end up what the seller thought it would be. And the seller thinks, well, that's because the purchaser changed the business. I would have run it differently. So if you're the purchaser, um, you've also got your issues with this. The seller is probably going to want to stay involved if there's an earn out, and the seller is probably going to want some, con some controls around how you run the business afterwards. Um, if I'm acting for the, the purchaser, um, normally my clients are saying, well, well, I don't want the seller dictating how I run the business once I own it. So look, there's some tensions there. Um, it can be a really useful tool, and, and we see it a lot, but there's also some risks that come with it. Another interesting question is how does this COVID world we live in affect earnouts? Well, as, as our friends in Sydney and certainly us here in Melbourne have found recently and even up in Brisbane, um, sometimes the state premiers decide to close down the cities and, and business um, at short notice. And if you've got an earnout which essentially is based on the performance of the business over a certain period, well, what happens if, if your earn out is for, is for 12 months and six of those months is spent in lockdown where the business can't earn any money? Well, that's pretty unfortunate. And you might argue, if you're the seller, that's not a real reflection of my business that you're buying. That's, that's abnormal. We need to take that out. We need to take that out of the equation. Um, so let's say that your earn out is a multiple of an EBITDA number. Um, and earnings. So that multiple of, of the earnings, uh, let's, let's take that over the six months that we're not locked down, for example. But anyway, this is, a, this is something we're seeing a bit more at the moment and certainly is being given some thought. Next, I wanted to talk about liability, which is always something you need to be careful about in, in sales. We're talking about big numbers in a lot of cases. Um, the buyer's coming in, the buyer doesn't understand the business as well. So they're going to be pouring carefully over all the information you give them. They're going to make decisions um, based on that. And they're going to want a bunch of, of reassurances. And they'll normally be in the form of warranties and indemnities. The key thing I say to clients when I'm, I'm dealing with warranties and indemnities is you need to make sure this is all true. You need to be really confident about what you're saying. And if you don't, you need to be disclosing it. So general warranties are title. Do you own the business you're selling? Capacity, can you enter into the contract? And solvency. Last thing you want is a liquidator to come in just after you've sold the business and try and reverse the, the transaction. And then we've got deal specific warranties, intellectual property, accounts, employees. And there's always going to be a lot of warranties about the truth of information. So the truth of the accounts. And going back to that point I, I made before, 
if you disclose the information, the lawyer for the, the seller, so I'm acting for the seller, I'll always insist that there's a provision in the sale agreement which says anything that's been disclosed modifies the warranty. So the, the buyer comes in, you tell them about, about um, certain problems with the company, they're coming in with their eyes open and it's not really fair that they sue you later if they know that they're taking this problem on. Indemnities are also a source of, of heavy negotiation and transactions. And while they play a similar, a similar role as warranties, they're a lot easier to, to enforce. And, and, and for that reason, people tend to look at them more like insurance. Um, if I'm the seller, I'm going to say, I'm, I'm not here to give you insurance. Um, if I'm the buyer, I'm, I'm saying, well, this is about risk allocation. You need to take allocation of these risks. And where they tend to be used is in respect of specific issues. So tax is a, is, is a common one. Um, another example in a recent transaction I, I dealt with was, um, was where our client had a particular patent and there were some questions as to whether um, the inventor had assigned that a patent across. So our client was, was quite comfortable about the position. Our, our client knew the inventor and was confident that the inventor, inventor would provide the documentation that was needed to, to prove ownership of the patent. But for timing reasons, they decided to go ahead before they could get that documentation and provided a specific indemnity in respect of ownership of that patent. Um, and ultimately, after it completed, they got the assignment they needed from the inventor and they were happy. Everyone walked away happy. Of course, if they weren't confident with that, and I certainly counseled them to be careful before they took this on upon themselves, um, they would never have wanted to give that indemnity and they perhaps would have wanted to have tidied up those intellectual property aspects before the sale. Warranty and indemnity insurance. Well, that's another one of these emerging topics and it's becoming more and more prevalent. Traditionally, you'd see it a lot in private equity deals. So if you think about the way private equity work, they raise a whole bunch of money from investors, they set up a fund, they go out, they, they buy companies, businesses, they fatten them up and they sell them for a profit over a, over a short period. And when they sell them, they wanna be able to distribute the funds to their investors and shut down the shut down the fund that um, is there. So they don't want a hangover of potential liability. So what they decided to do is they decided to offload that risk onto the insurers who were happy to do so, provided sufficient due diligence had been done. We're beginning to see this more and more part of deals um, beyond private equity. And I suppose an example of where it could be uh, quite attractive to a seller who, who's not private equity is if they're selling out, perhaps they're looking to retire, they want to move on, they want a clean slate, and taking out this warranty and indemnity insurance could potentially allow them to walk away um, feeling a little bit more comfortable. Of course, there's a lot of fine print in these documents, insurers are never going to insure for fraud. Um, so that doesn't reduce the amount of due diligence and care you need to take in making sure that the information you're giving is correct. Due diligence, another hugely important topic. If you're the buyer, you wanna know what you're getting into and you don't understand the business as well as the seller. Um, you're gonna pour through all the information given. From the, from the seller's perspective, um, I often counsel as full release of information as possible, which sometimes there's a, there's a little bit of a tension between doing that and releasing the confidential information that we talked about before, which you might hold back in a black box. And, and again, the reason why I, I like to disclose fairly heavily is, is because that, that clause I'll be negotiating for the, for the sellers which says anything which has been disclosed will modify the warranties. And um, 
that same clause is a really good reason to have a data room. So you get a data room and you've, you've got data rooms from Dropboxes to more professional data rooms like the Intralinks or the Ansarata data rooms we see. And uh, the, the, the benefit of the, of the professional data rooms is they enable you to track who's seen particular documents as well as coordinate the responses to questions and answers amongst your own team. Um, and, and again, if you've, in, if you've disclosed problematic information in the data room, later the seller comes back and says, sorry, the, the purchaser comes back and says, well, here's this issue. We want you to, we want you to make us good. We, we want you to pay us some money. Well, if you're the seller, you, you go back and say, well, here's the records from the data room. In fact, I've got a record here that two of your employees looked at this document on the 12th of July, um, they then forwarded it on to another one of your employees. So you went in with your eyes open. Um, let's let's all walk away and not end up in litigation. Assessing bids. Well, the key point is not all dollars are equal. Um, you want cash. You want cash at completion if you can get it. But earnouts and deferred consideration. Well, that's there's a risk there. Um, you might not get the money or all the money you're expected, or shares. Shares are sometimes offered by purchasers, particularly if they want the seller to keep some skin in the game. And if you're getting shares, and particularly if the shares are a large part of the consideration, you may want to do some due diligence on the buyer because you're, you're buying into their business in the same way that they're buying into yours. Um, Tax, tax structures will affect the returns. So again, talk to, talk to our good friends RSM or some other tax advisors to, to tell you what that's going to mean. And then I've just set out some bullet points on due diligence on the potential bidders. Uh, credit worthy, I suppose, is the other point which I hadn't mentioned. Uh, you you want to know that, that these people, you're spending a whole lot of time and, and potentially cost on, on negotiating terms with can actually come up with the money. And, and I have seen situations where, where um, deals have fallen apart because there was a little bit too much optimism on the buyer's part as to being able to get their funding. Dealing with different types of buyers. Again, um, some of these points Tim touched on, but it, it's really important to to talk about them, um, trade competitors. There's that real danger of showing them your business before they're paid for it, before they've bought it, and giving them the opportunity to undermine your business, take your business by going to your clients, going to your employees, and, 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 and essentially getting the benefit without paying for it. So, those issues around balancing up what you disclose, confidentiality, when you disclose it. And again, as Tim mentioned, I like to hold back certain information uh, until, until you've got a binding deal, a binding piece of paper. The other issue with dealing with trade competitors is if it's a, certainly if it's a large deal, it may need a triple C merger clearance, and that'll need to be a condition precedent but that tends to be in the larger deals where you're talking about competition issues. Private equity is another type of buyer we see a lot. They tend to want to come in, buy a business, fatten it up and sell it. So we're, we're talking about short horizons. Uh, they can be quite sophisticated because they may have done a lot of deals. They may not know the particular industry as well as a trade competitor, but um, they tend to be able to to run a deal reasonably quick and reasonably efficiently. But they're going to ask a lot of questions and the due diligence is going to be thorough. Also, um, th there's maybe a little bit of a stigma to private equity and that they're seen because of their short-term horizons to be not as sensitive towards uh, long-standing employees or tradition. But look, in, in reality, trade competitors, you know, you can see the same thing if, if you're selling your business to a trade competitor they're going to see some efficiencies through, through reducing double up in employees and they've got their own traditions. 
So um, personally, I wouldn't be too worried about that. Employees, well, I guess the key point here is a lot of companies like to give their employees shares to try and motivate them and align their, their, um, align their incentives uh, to build the business. And, and look, that can be a very, very valid strategy in some circumstances, but it can also create a lot of problems. Imagine you've, you've got, got an employee, you've given them 2% of the business, you've fallen out with that employee, the employee's left the business, uh, a couple of years later, you go to sell and there's big dollars and people are talking about Maseratis and then suddenly you realise that that someone who you fell out with has got 2% of the business and they're stuck there. Purchaser may not want to buy those circumstances. So key thing is if you are looking at employee share schemes or if you're looking at um, at giving any equity to employees, just make sure that there's a, there's a documentation which deals with with dragging them into sales or getting them out if there's a falling out. Normally you might have that in a shareholders agreement. So look, really important tip, get a shareholders agreement and do that as part of your preparation, part of your preparation for sale if you don't have one already. Um, look, finally, management buyouts. I find management buyouts are really, a really helpful, um, really practical way of keeping the business going. Um, it, can, it can enable, the continuity of the business, management executives are going to understand the employees, they're going to understand the, they're going to understand the customers, and typically that can result in, in the, least, um, uh, the least problems in, in keeping the business going as it was running. The downside is they may not have the money, um, so they may want to pay over time, and that might not work, so um, some pros and cons. Finally, I've just set out some summaries here and I won't go into all of that. You can see the bullet points there. Um, there's some advantages and some disadvantages for sales to PE or venture capital. Um, there's uh, some advantages and disadvantages to selling to corporates and, and um, other industry participants, particularly when they're competitors. There's that really crucial point about holding back the, the real confidential information. Um, management succession, I, I, I like this, I like management succession, but you might not get the same price you want. Um, and if you're dealing with management and you're dealing with third parties, um, there's, there's the risk too that the management might not have the same, um, the, the, same the same incentive to help to the sale of the third parties. If it's a, if you're in an auction, auction scenario and you're selling to management and to others at the same time. So you have to be quite careful with those dynamics. And then finally, another option for selling is the initial public offer. I'm not going to talk about that here, but our next session is on IPOs and my colleague um, Brent will be talking in more detail about that. But that's certainly another good option for exiting. Okay, so that's the end of my piece. I think we're on to questions now. Do we have any questions? Thanks, Toby. We have had a couple of questions come through. Uh, the first one being is that we hear in the media that there is about to be a boom in M&A sales. What are the key factors driving this? Tim, I think this is a, a good one for you. Sure, sure. Thanks, Fran. I think I can probably distill that into five key drivers. I've, I've already sort of touched on succession, but another one we're seeing a huge amount of activity coming from is private equity, not just um, locally, but globally. There's a, a lot of dry powder and capital to be deployed. Um, and a lot of those P funds have got a mid-market focus. So we're seeing a huge amount of transaction volume um, coming from that from that particular buyer market. Um, you know, there's a lot of foreign deal makers looking at Australia as a as a geography for investment. You know, we've got low geopolitical risk. Um, strong economic thematics. So that's driving a lot of activity from foreign acquirers. Um, we're obviously in a low interest rate regime, which again makes debt pretty cheap um, and, and transactions pretty good to, to undertake. Uh, and then the last one is uh, we're seeing a lot of companies divest non-core assets. So, you know, unloved businesses that are not a core, um, you know, vendors are choosing to, to sell them to, to someone who will look after them and make it a much better return. 
Great, thank you. Uh, we've had another question. Um, are there any common or easily avoidable mistakes that you see cause transactions go wrong? Toby. Sure, I can talk to that. Um, off the top of my head, there's a few things I've touched on before. So uh, not having a, a shareholders agreement. If you've got a bunch of shareholders and you wanna sell, uh, you, you think you're gonna be able to get them on board. What happens if one of them decides not to sell and, and undermines the transaction. So you need to be ready to get all your shareholders on, on board. You need a shareholders agreement. Generally, that'll have drag long provisions to allow that. Another one I touched on is earnouts, um, where earnouts are not properly defined. That can be a big opportunity for argument. Um, information. So you, you need to be prepared for the sale. The, a lot of the things which, which um, were dealt with in the last session about getting ready for sale. So just remember, the buyer's going to come in. They want to they look at everything. So if you've gone through your documentation, your business, and you've, you've fixed a lot of those problems beforehand, then you don't have to try and fix them in the moment. And if you've done your, your pre-sale um, vendor due diligence, then you can answer to the questions and and give them give them a reasonable response, which is true. I've, I've certainly seen situations where a, a vendor has has come into a sale and not been ready, and perhaps and perhaps not even intentionally, but um, has ended up giving some wrong answers to questions, and and that can be a real problem in terms of your your warranties and indemnities. And and, and even if you you fix that by correcting yourself before completion, it just makes you look like you don't understand your business and it means the, the buyer's not gonna have confidence in, in you and your business and, and worried there might be other uh, skeletons in the closet. And then I suppose finally, um, it was that point about releasing confidential information too early. Um, I, I've seen situations where um, deals had fallen apart because it was clear that the, the buyer was only interested in finding out information on their competitors. Thanks, Toby. Um, and we've got one final question that's come in, which is, in which industries do you expect to see most business sale activity going forward? Tim, we'll start with you. Yeah, look, I think it'll be a continuation of what occurred over the last 12 months with you know technology, media and telco being the standout sector. Uh, I'm sure everyone's aware of the Afterpay Square deal. You know, it, it will be the largest transaction ever in Australia. And interestingly, um, the first transaction that's not, you know, property or infrastructure related. So, you know, that really paves the way for, you know, a new paradigm um, where I think tech will continue to stand out. Um, and we'll see a shift away from, you know, hard, hard assets being, you know, the standout sector. Look, I think health, um, pharmaceuticals, um, consumer will continue to, to do well as, um, as well as it has done over the last 12 months. Um, and, and I think Agri, again, we'll, 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 um, we'll, we'll see a spate of activity in that particular sector as well. Yeah, and no, look, I'll just add to that. Um, Definitely, we're seeing tech as being a, a key driver of, of sales. And, and when I say tech, it's not necessarily a company which sees itself as technology um, based, but these days, all, all companies and all businesses tend to have some sort of a technology nature to what they do. So um, when, when you're fattening yourself up for sale, that's something we're thinking about. And I, I suppose just to add to Tim's point around Afterpay, uh, Iris, that's another technology company. I think um, only a couple of days ago, they had a, a bid, um, which they knocked back, but it shows that the technology is in play and maybe adding a technology flavor to, to an industry which isn't necessarily seen as technology can be a way to, to get some of that, uh, you know, some of that gold glitter added to, to your price. Um, and, and I suppose PE, well, they want anything with cash flow. So they're, they're buying wherever they can. Great. Thanks, Tim. And thanks, Toby. We don't have any more questions um, at this stage. Um, as we discussed earlier, if you'd like to reach out to either Toby or Tim, these are their contact details um, if you require any further information.
Um, our next webinar, so webinar three, is to be held on the 18th of August and we'll be covering exiting via an IPO. So we hope that you can join us for our next webinar and thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Ron. Thanks for joining. Thank you.